Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 will be in verses 13 and 14 this morning. Jesus is now coming to the conclusion of this wonderful sermon. It'll take us a while to work through the conclusion as it has through the rest of the sermon. But this is a masterful sermon of our Lord Jesus Christ, preached by the Master himself. And in this conclusion, Jesus gives a call to action, or maybe better said, a command to action. A command by our Lord that must be heeded. A command by our Lord that is the only logical conclusion to come to, if you have listened to this sermon at all. A command that if you refuse to heed, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road, and I'm sorry, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Father, help us once again this morning. Be our helper again, as you have been in days past. Do so again this morning by your Spirit. Work, work through us and in us, Father. Anoint your word as it goes forth. Father, send it forth so that it may do all that you send it forth to do, we pray. Work in us, change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If after listening to all of this sermon and thinking about just how wonderful of a study it has been. If you just think well of this sermon of Jesus, if you just are amazed by his teaching, but then at the end of his teaching, you do not heed the call, you've totally missed it. It's all been for nothing. I mean, you could live a better life, I guess, if you try to obey what Jesus has laid out, you could probably get along better with neighbors and friends and family if you would live as he instructs. It might make you a more successful person in life by the world's definition. It may make you a more well-liked person. But if all you strive to do is to obey all that God has taught in the sermon, all that Christ has taught us in the sermon, and you don't strive to obey the command in this text... And again, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's that stark. It's that fearsome, this text. And Jesus here is calling or commanding for a decision in his conclusion. But more than that, this command is something that we must obey. We must obey. He does so in the conclusion by using three different illustrations. He talks about two gates, the wide and the narrow, that lead to two ways, the broad or the constricted, that lead to two destinations, destruction or life, that are traveled by two groups of people, the many or the few. That's illustration number one, and we will work through that this morning. But he also uses two trees, the bad tree and the good tree, that produce two different fruits, the bad fruit and the good fruit. He also, in his conclusion, will talk about two different men, the foolish man and the wise man, building on two different foundations, shifting sand or solid rock. And so as we approach this, we understand that this is grievous to our hearts if we don't obey, that this is dangerous if we don't obey. Now, in, in, these conclusion, in this conclusion, Jesus really, you could say, obliterates two persistent heresies that have existed in the church at various points. Two persistent her- heresies that creep into the church currently. One of them, he really destroys the idea of universalism. Universalism is the idea that everyone will be saved in the end. That all people will go to heaven 
Yeah, there may be, they may sometimes think of different degrees of heaven, but they try to teach, they, they, they emphasize, overemphasize the love of God, which you say, how can you overemphasize the love of God? Because they remove God's justice in talking about his love. And they say, all people are going to heaven. Everyone is going to heaven. And Jesus obliterates that here. He says, no, there's, there's two ways, there's two kinds of people. There's those on the narrow road, those on the broad road. There's good trees and there's, there's bad trees. There's foolish men and wise men. And that's all there is. And there are some foolish, and there are some bad trees, and there are those on the broad road that are headed to destruction. And Jesus obliterates universalism. He also obliterates what you might term as omnism. You say, what is omnism? That's the idea that all religions are legitimate, that every religion leads to God. They might not go as far as universalism, but they would say, hey, no matter what you practice, You'll go to heaven. There's truth in all religion. All roads of religion lead to God. We need to be clear. Jesus is not inclusive. Jesus is exclusive. He is the way, the truth, and the life. You can't claim to love Christ and add others to him. It's Christ or nothing. It is in Christ and him alone. And to reach any other conclusion and say that you love Christ is to deny the Christ you claim to love. There are two ways. There are two kinds of people. And we must understand there are those that are lead on the road that leads to life and there are those on the road that leads to destruction. And the command Jesus gives us here at the beginning of the text is enter through the narrow gate. I want to be clear. Jesus is not suggesting here. Jesus is commanding us to enter through the narrow gate. Many churches will do invitations. We don't. And I'm not going to talk about the merit of invitations or altar calls here. That's not my point. They've only been around, though, for about 200 years or so in the church. But Jesus here doesn't give an invitation, Jesus gives a command. He gives a command. Enter through the narrow gate. It's similar to the command that he gave when he first came on the scene. (laughs) Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is a command. When we share the gospel with others, church family, when we share the gospel with others, we must be clear with them that if they don't obey the gospel, they're disobedient to Christ. This isn't something for them to contemplate. This is something for them to obey. They must obey. And they ought to leave that conversation going, well, I know one thing. I know one thing. That they think I'm being disobedient to Christ if I don't repent, if I don't turn. Because they must know Jesus doesn't just invite, Jesus commands. And as those who represent Christ, when we share the gospel, we must command people as well. Repent. Enter through the narrow gate. Obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Life or death hangs in the balance. And we can't be mealy-mouthed and wishy-washy and say, well, you know, just come along, maybe try Jesus for a while. No. Enter through the narrow gate. We must command people when we share the gospel to repent. Repent to turn and follow after Jesus. And so in his illustration, he uses two gates, he uses two ways, talks about two destinations and two different groups of people. So let's look at the two gates. The first gate, for the gate is wide. That's the wide gate. And so I want you to use this morning your sanctified imaginations, if you would, to picture a wide gate. And I tried to look up, Google knows all, so I tried to look up what is the widest gate, and I got multiple pieces of information. So I went with the one that maybe all of us could probably picture, I think, uh, the St. Louis Gateway Arch. And uh, that thing is 630 feet wide by 630 feet tall. You can fit anything through that gate. (laughs) I can't think of anything that you couldn't fit through that gate, especially if you're just carrying it on your person. 
There's nothing that you can put on your person that you can fit through. That is two football fields nearly anyway, wide, and two football fields tall. Anything will go through that gate. It is a wide and welcoming gate. There would be no intimidation to enter into that gate. It's a gate that would feel very comfortable to us to walk through. It would feel very natural for us to walk through that gate. No one would have a hesitation to walk through the wide gate. Not a gate like that. I can see everything on the other side. It seems just clear as can be. But then he talks about the narrow gate. He says, for the gate is narrow. The one he commands us to enter into is a narrow gate. I want you to picture an obscure, off of the beaten path gate that most people would never even notice. They would focus on the broad gate and never even see this little gate obscure over here because it's so small, it's so off the beaten path. I want you to think of it being very narrow. You could think turnstile, when you go into a game or a concert or a stadium, something like that, you have to enter through a turnstile. You've probably been there before. And if you were to try to carry a bunch of luggage through there, you might be able to get it through if you dragged it over the top, but you would have a hard time entering through that, wouldn't you? But this turnstile is that narrow all the way up. There's no way you're going to get anything else through. It's a very narrow gate. It's not wide enough for luggage. It's not wide enough to bring your baggage with you. In fact, let's talk about some baggage that you can't take through the narrow gate. The first thing, the first piece of baggage that you can't take through that narrow gate is your purse. And what I mean by your purse is your material goods, your riches. They won't fit through the gate. You can't get them through this gate. It's too narrow. It, it will not accommodate your material goods. It will not accommodate your purse. The rich young ruler, you remember him? He found that out. Remember his conversation with Jesus, and at the, towards the end, first he came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to inherit the kingdom or inherit eternal life? How can I get through the gate? And of course, you go through the whole narrative, but towards the end, Jesus said, there's one thing you lack. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. Drop your purse. Drop your material goods. And what was the response of the rich young ruler? He went away sorrowing. Why? Because there's no way he was letting go of his purse. There's no way he was letting go of his material goods. And I think, I've said this before, I think sometimes we read that and we think, we're horrified. Jesus, you're letting him get away. He's not going to enter the gate. Well, Jesus knows his heart. And Jesus knows he must drop his purse. He wants to follow me. And this man hangs on to his riches. You can't get your purse through the narrow gate. It will not fit. Another piece of baggage that will not fit through the gate is your personal piety. Your personal piety, your righteousness, your religious works and duties that you've performed, if you want to hang on to those, you can't go through the gate. If you try to grip those and try to get through the gate, you will not get through it. In fact, in this very sermon, the first words Jesus says in Matthew 5, 3 is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You cannot enter with your personal piety. You've got to drop that. You've got to be spiritually poor to enter the kingdom of heaven, to enter through the gate. It's not even possible to get through the gate with your personal piety, your religious works, your good deeds. Another piece of baggage that you need to drop is your perversity or your sinfulness, your wickedness. You cannot carry that in. That baggage will not fit through the gate. You've got to drop it. You've got to repent of it. You've got to let it go. Ephesians 5, 5 and 6 says this. Ephesians 5, 5 and 6. For this we know with certainty that no one sexually immoral or impure or greedy who is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, 
For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. There are people who live lifestyles and they claim to be Christians that fit in these categories or the categories laid out in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And they live those lifestyles, they claim to be a Christian. And I tell you, they have never entered the narrow gate if that's the lifestyle they want to live. They've never come in. They, can't, they couldn't possibly get through with their perversity. Not a chance. Now this next piece of baggage might surprise you, but you've got to leave your people behind too. You've got to leave your family. You've got to leave your friends behind. There's not enough room through the gate for you to drag your family with you, to drag your mom and your dad or your children. There's not enough room. You've got to come in by yourself. If you require that your family goes with you or you won't enter the gate, then you cannot enter the gate. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 10, 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You want to enter through the gate, leave them behind. You say, but I want them to come. I understand that. Enter through the gate. You can plead with them to enter through the gate as well. But if they are going to stop you from entering the gate, then, then you can't get in. You can't get in. You've got to love Christ more. The last thing, this one might really surprise you, there's one other piece of baggage that you can't enter through the gate with, and it's your person. It's you. So wait a minute, Jesus just told me, enter through the narrow gate. What do you mean I can't enter through the narrow gate? You can't bring the old self through the narrow gate. You can't bring your person through the narrow gate. You've got to deny yourself. What did Jesus say? Matthew, 15, I'm sorry, Matthew 16, verse 24. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Deny yourself, die on the cross, and follow after Jesus. That has to happen for you to get through this gate. You cannot even bring your own self through the gate. You have to leave self behind to enter through the gate. You come in alone. You come in naked. You come in forsaking everything. You come in through this gate, leaving it all behind. It is that narrow. It is that narrow. Some may sit here this morning and say, that's not the gate I entered into. Then you haven't entered the gate yet. Enter through the gate. You have to forsake everything and follow after Christ. That's the call of the gospel. That's what we're called to. And then, not only does he talk about a gate, but he talks about two ways, two paths, two roads. Look again in verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad. The broad way. Again, sanctified imaginations. I want you to think of eight lanes of traffic and... In Chicago, maybe not during rush hour, but maybe at three in the morning. Smooth sailing. I mean, the way is broad. It's an easy road to travel. It's a very accommodating road. In fact, there is no need to forsake anything to be on this road. There's room for all the baggage you want to carry on this road. Whatever you want, you are free to carry whatever you want to carry on this road. It's a very welcoming road. It's the come-as-you-are road. It's the tolerant road. It's the accepting road. Does that not sound inviting? Well, come on. That sounds inviting. Be honest. Sounds very inviting. But he says that's not the road you're supposed to be on. Now you enter the narrow gate, and look with me again at verse 14. 
For the gate is narrow, and the way is constricted, my translation says. Some of your translations might say difficult, hard. This road is not at all like the broad road. It's a, I want you to think of a narrow pathway through the woods, a very narrow pathway with a, a thick forest, and there's brambles on all sides, and you have to navigate through, and you have to be careful, and sometimes maybe you can only walk sideways because it's so restrictive, it's so narrow. You cannot come through the gate and think then you can reach back through the gate and grab your baggage and walk the road. Some people, I think, have done that. I'll come through the gate, I'll hope in Christ, and I'll go back to what I said I forsook, and I'll take it with me. I'll live that life for a little while or say the right things, confess to God the right things, but I'm going to bring that baggage in with me one at a time. You can't walk the road, you won't make any progress on that road. No progress at all. So you can't carry your purse. You can't pick it back up after you get through. You wouldn't be able to make any progress on the road. That purse would keep you from making any progress down this road because it would cling to the, the brambles on the side and, and, and trip you up. You just There's no room for that baggage. There's no room for that baggage on this road. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You have to have a choice. Put down your wealth or carry your wealth. Carry your wealth, you're not on. If you can carry your wealth, you cannot be on the narrow road. You can't be. Because there's no room on that road to travel with your purse. Same with your personal piety. You say, wait a minute, am I not supposed to become righteous as a Christian? Absolutely you are. We're not talking about the righteousness given to us by Christ. We're talking about your self-righteousness, your personal piety, your perception of piety. In Galatians, Paul is talking to the church there about circumcision. That's a religious practice the Jewish people did. And there were some in the church who were trying to make all Christians say, you must practice this religious practice, circumcision, if you're going to truly be in the church. And Paul is condemning that idea. Don't go back to those religious practices. In Galatians 5, 6, and 7, he says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. You hear that? It means nothing. Your personal piety means nothing in Christ. But faith, working through love. And then he says this, you were running well. Sounds like you're on a path, doesn't it? And you were running well. And he says, who hindered you from obeying the truth? You pick up your personal piety, you pick up your religiosity, you can't go anywhere. You're only hindered by that on this constricted road. Same with your perversity. 1 John 1, 5 and 6. And this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not do the truth. We lie. If you say, I'm in Christ, but I live in my perversity, you're a liar. You're a liar. You can't live that way. Not on this road. Not on this constricted road. You also can't pick up your people. You can't pick up the baggage of people and walk this road. Matthew 10, 34. Jesus says it this way. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. You say, wait a minute. Goodwill, peace on earth to men, right? What? Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, 
And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. On this narrow road, if people and family are more important to you, then you can't walk this road. You can't claim to be on this road and say, family is everything to me. Nope. You're not, you can't be walking the narrow road and be claiming that. You have to be able to put that baggage down and leave it behind. Finally, you also can't continue to pick up your person. Galatians 5.24, Paul says this, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. I want you to notice, he says he crucified the flesh. If you are in Christ, he says you have crucified the flesh. You're dead. Reckon yourselves as dead to sin. We die in Christ. We die daily. We're dead. But I want you to also notice, he says, not only your, the, the, the flesh, with its passions and desires. I had two people approach me this week asking me about same-sex attraction because a, a local pastor has said that same-sex attraction is just temptation and it's not sin. Well, my Bible tells me that those who are in Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You crucify that. It is sin to be attracted to what God says is an abomination. It is sin to be attracted to what God hates. That's sin. I'm thankful that many of those people would say, we don't act on it. I'm thankful for that. That's a good step. But crucify your desire. Crucify it. Kill it. Put it to death. Go to Matthew chapter 5. When I think in my heart about that, that guy who cut me off in traffic, and I think, what an idiot. That's sin. I've murdered him. Because that desire still dwells in me. I need to crucify that. Don't I? I need to put it all to death. The sanctification is not simply an outside work. Sanctification is an inside work with the inner person. It happens at the heart level. It's not all doing things on the outside the right way. It's being transformed on the inside. That's what sanctification is. That is the life of the believer, isn't it? It can be changed on the inside, not just the outside. So I'll tell you, make no mistake, this pastor will tell you same-sex attraction is sin. It needs to be crucified. And I don't know if anybody struggles with that here. Nobody, he, nobody here was coming to me saying, I struggle with this. They just were questioning and, 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 and seeing, probably seeing where I stand, more or less. But know that it is sin. Not only can we bring no baggage on this road, on this way, but this is a difficult road to walk even without the baggage. You know that? For the Christian life, it's a difficult life. I mean, it's a joyful life too, I'm not, but it's a difficult road to walk. It can be a lonely road. Some of you have experienced that in your workplace ostracized because you're a Christian, maybe. Others saying, you know, somebody talking behind your back, yeah, they go to church every Sunday, you know, or they ask you, how was your weekend? Well, like usual, I went to church. Oh, you just always go to church, don't you? It can be a lonely road, just, just subtle pushes away from the world. I've said before, our neighborhood, will they'll get together, they haven't, maybe they've done it and they didn't invite us anymore, I don't know, but, but they used to do anyway in our little circle, they'd do a little fire in there, the neighbors get together, and, and I would go, but I felt so alone there. Our family would just not fit in. They'd start saying, I think one time it was like, what, what concerts have you been to recently? Or what, what was your first concert? That's what it was. And they all went around, you know, all these bands that you probably would, heard, would have heard of. Uh, maybe some we haven't. And then they came to me, and I'm like, well, I went to a Russ Taft concert. And they're like, who's Russ Taft? I'm like, well, he's a Christian artist from back in the day. And, and I mean, just so out of place. So they start talking about movies, and I'm like, no, I haven't seen that. No, I haven't seen that. No, I haven't seen that. You know, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to watch that. I'm just so alone, you know. I don't love those events, to be honest with you, but why do I go? Because i got to be salt and light, don't I? So I go. I don't like it, but I go. But it's uncomfortable. It's difficult. It's lonely sometimes. It can be a road of loss, especially when you think about all the baggage you left behind. 
Isn't it? Have some of you lost family since you've come to Christ? Some of you might have children that you lost because you stay faithful to Christ. It's a difficult road to get rid of all that baggage because you don't see it as baggage, do you? You see it as loved ones. It's difficult to live with self-denial, self-control. It's heartache. Suffering, wrong, and persecution happens, doesn't it? In fact, didn't Jesus say, blessed are you when people persecute you for the sake of righteousness? For there's the kingdom of heaven. There's, there's suffering with persecution. And Jesus describes a very difficult path, a very difficult life here. But then he comes to the two destinations. Back in 13, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. It leads to death. It leads to ruin. The people on the broad road are living the good life. You could say they're living their best life now, but they're headed for destruction. They're headed for hell. They're headed for eternal damnation. Do you remember the rich man and the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? When he was in Hades, he's crying out to Abraham. And Abraham responds to him, remember that during your life, you received good things. And likewise, Lazarus, bad things. But now, he is being comforted here, and you're in agony. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 25, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever wishes to save their purse, whoever wishes to save their own piety, whoever wishes to save their perversity, whoever wishes to save their people, whoever wishes to save their own person will lose their life in the end. All of that baggage must be left outside of the gate and cannot be picked up. And then he talks about the narrow gate. Back in verse 14. For the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life. The destination of those that enter through the narrow gate that are on that constricted path, their destination is life. Eternal life. Eternal life with Christ. a difficult life, but it leads to eternal life. It's a hard life, but it leads to real life, doesn't it? In fact, isn't that the joy that we have on this road when it's difficult is that this isn't it? I expected a big amen there. <laughs> this isn't it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'll try to help you. <laughs> It leads to eternal life. The last half of Matthew 16, 25 that I read earlier, which says, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, says this, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It is the only road that leads to life. Two roads, church, two roads. One to destruction, one to life. The people on the broad road they seek to have no regrets in this life. They're going to live it up. I don't want to have any regrets. I'm going to do what feels good, do what I want to do. I'm going to fulfill all my desires as much as possible. And they will live with eternal regret. They will live with eternal regret. And the people on the narrow road, there can be a sense at times while we walk this narrow road, and I don't mean this to say that this is true regret, but there can be times where we might look at our life and look at those on the broad road and maybe regret a little bit. It's hard. And there's a sense of maybe just a tinge of, it'd be easier to be over there. But if that's the road you're on and you're walking that narrow road, let me tell you this morning, you will have absolutely no regrets in eternity. None. None. 
And eternity is much longer than what you're going to experience here. So much longer. Because it never stops. This, I hate to break it to you, but you're going to die. Some of you sooner than others. Maybe I'll be the next one. I don't know. But we're all going to die. We're not getting out of this life alive. And when we do, it's set for eternity. There's also the two groups of people. Look back at verse 13 again. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. There are the many who enter the wide gate. And of course, of course many enter that gate. It's accommodating. It's easy. It's, it's natural. I mean, it makes perfect natural sense to go through that wide gate. Especially even if you know about the other gate. It's like, why would I do that? The majority of people, though, we must understand it. The majority of the people in this planet, the majority of the people that you run into at Acme or run into, they're on the broad road. They're on the road leading to destruction. That's the road they're on. They're not giving a second thought to eternity for the most part. They're thinking about the here and the now. They love the road they're on. Because after all, I can have every, any and every desire I want on that road. Whatever makes me happy, I can fulfill it on that road. Why wouldn't they want that road? Proverbs 14, 12. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. It seems right. It's natural, fitting, but it's death. And then there are the few that enter the narrow gate. For the gate is narrow, verse 14, for the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life and there are few that find it. Now the word few, it means relatively few. So it's not like there's only a few, like three or four. The few is relative to the many. There's many on the broad road. There are comparatively few on the narrow road. Few even find the gate. Few even ever notice the gate. They live their life so focused on their own pleasures and desires. And, and by the way, I know when I say that, some of you think, not everybody's so evil. No, in this sense. They're not all doing as much evil as they can come up with or as we could come up with. They're just out living life for self. Just what pleases them. And that doesn't mean they're out murdering people. They're living a good life, a moral life. Why? Because that's what they want to do. It's got nothing to do with Christ. It's got to do with what they want to live, how they want to live. It's an easier life. It's a better life to live a moral life for many people. And they don't do it because of Christ or God. They do it because that's what they want to do. They're just living their lives without a thought for Christ, without a thought for God. They're not all out there doing the most evil that they possibly could. And few of them even find the gate. No one really looks for it. The Bible says there's none who seek God, not even one. There's no one who looks for the gate. You didn't look for the gate. You say, no, no, I was seeking God. The Bible says you weren't. You might have been seeking what only God could give you, and you found it in God. But you weren't seeking God. We seek eternal life, don't we? But do we seek God? I mean, all, if I ask, if I was in a room full of unbelievers, and I said, who all wants to go to heaven when you die? I'd be shocked if not every hand went up in the air and said, me. They all want to go to heaven when they die. But I like what Paul Washer said. They just hope God isn't there when they get there. Because God is holy and righteous. And if you love unrighteousness here, what would you want to do with God in heaven? Nothing. They don't want to go to heaven. They just don't want to go to hell. That's the reality. But they still want to live for self. So they don't look for the gate. 
The gate is narrow, it's small, it's not pleasing when you find that gate. In fact, who would want to give up all that baggage? Who would want to give up all that baggage to enter through that gate? You'd have to be almost crazy. Or you'd have to be a new creation. It it would take a miracle for anyone to enter through that gate. And that's exactly what it takes to enter through that gate. When someone enters that gate, I want you to understand this. That is a miracle of God. If you have entered through the gate, you need to understand this. It was not you entering through the gate. It was God bringing you through the gate. God dragged you through that gate. God showed you the gate. That's why it's all of grace. There's nothing for us to boast in, is there? We don't sit here and say, I went through the gate. I don't know what's wrong with all those other people. No, we sit here and go, praise God, he brought me through the gate. Thank you, God, you brought me through. Because I would have never left all that behind. I would have never left it. Only God can do this work. Who would want to give up all that baggage? Jesus described that one who would want to give up all that baggage at the beginning of this sermon. They're the poor in spirit. They're spiritually poor. They know nothing good dwells in them. And they mourn that And they're lowly before God and they hunger and thirst for righteousness because they know they have none of their own that must be given to them. They need to be satisfied. And they know only God can satisfy me. And they hunger and thirst so much for righteousness, for Christ, that they don't care what it costs them. They need that. I must have Christ. And it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what I lose if I could just have Christ. So they hunger and they thirst. But how do they get into the gate? How do they find the gate? And Jesus taught that in the sermon too, didn't he? Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. The gate will be open to you. He said it's a work of God. So where must you go if you want to enter through the gate? If you say, I don't think I can let go of my purse. I don't think I can let go of my perversity. I don't think I can let go of my piety. I can't let go of my people. I can't let go of my person. Then you ask God to help you. He's the only one that can help you. So you ask and you seek and you knock. And you know what Jesus said? That the Father gives good gifts to those who ask. That is our God who gives good gifts to his children who ask. You come to him, he'll answer loud and clear. So two questions for application. Which road are you on? And I want you to think about it this way. I want you to examine your path, your way. Is it constricted? Is it difficult? Or are you living the good life? The easy life? Is it hard? Which road are you on? And and, and I want you to examine the road you're on. Don't, Don't look back and say, but I said a prayer 20 years ago. I walked an aisle. I raised my hand. I repeated after somebody. What they told me to say, they said if I did that, I'd go to heaven. Don't believe it. Which road are you on? What are you pursuing? Money? Riches? What are you pursuing? People? Family? Or are you pursuing Christ? Now, no, I know I preach this very strongly today. I understand that the Christian life is also sanctification. You don't arrive as soon as you get through the gate. We do tend to try to pick up our baggage, don't we? I'd still pick up baggage. And then I realize this doesn't work. (laughs) And I've got to set it down. So I know I preach it strongly, and I I intend to preach it strongly, and I kind of want to leave it there, but I don't want to discourage people. 
that life is a process of sanctification. So the question is, are you learning to love Christ more? Are you learning to let go of more? Do you sense the spirit inside of you calling you to change, to sanctification? What is God doing in your life? And if you say nothing, you're on the broad road. And I would tell you this morning, like Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. And you say, I don't know how. Ask, seek, and knock. Go to God and ask and seek and knock. And you stay there until he answers. Don't get up. Don't move. The service gets over. You sit in that pew until he answers you. Don't go anywhere. I'll stay here till 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 10 o'clock tonight. I don't care. Enter through the narrow gate. Beg God to work in your life. And then the other question, if I haven't beaten you enough, beaten you up enough today, the other question is, do we preach to others the same gospel that Jesus preaches here? I was in sales for most of my life. I don't mean this to be disrespectful or blasphemous at all, but if I was evaluating this as a sales pitch, Jesus failed in that. But he's not peddling the gospel. He's not selling the gospel. He's commanding people and giving them the raw truth. It is sorrowful to me that the gospel has been watered down so much in modern evangelism today. And, and, and I know some people like to respond if I talk like this in their own minds, or maybe they even say it to me, not here, but others have. Don't be critical of other people. They all mean well. They may mean well, but they're doing damage to people. There are many who have made professions of faith that are false. They're based on false premises, based on lies and deceptions. There are many who have asked Jesus into their heart, have accepted that God loves them and has a wonderful plan for their life. They've said the sinner's prayer, they've walked an aisle, they raised a hand, and believe that because they have done these things, they will enter the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus commands people to enter through the narrow gate, to lay down all of their baggage their purse, their piety, their perversity, their people, their own person, and enter through the narrow gate, to give your life up, to become a living sacrifice, to follow after Jesus, the one who gave up his life for us, the one who humbled himself, the one who took on flesh, the one who became obedient to death, even death on the cross, and Jesus says, I am your example. Follow me. but I think many Christians are afraid of that message. To call people to repentance, to call people to self-denial, because as I said earlier, who would respond to that positively? And we, look, I want to say this. It is good to want people to come to Christ. I I shouldn't have to say that, but I want to say that clearly. It is good to have a desire to see people saved. But what is evil is to get somebody to think they're saved when they're not. That's evil. So it's a wonderful thing to desire people to come saved, but if you convince people they're going to heaven when they're going to hell, you have done something, you have done a great atrocity. And unfortunately, I believe, I'm almost afraid to say it, that there's a reason for this fear that we have. And the reason is this that we don't really value Christ as much as we say we do. We are not peddlers of eternal fire insurance. We are not selling a get-out-of-hell-free card. We are proclaimers of the one true Christ. 
We preach Christ and him crucified. Why would we be afraid to command people to lose all of that baggage to come to Christ if we really valued him? If we thought Christ was everything. All I have is Christ. If we sing that, why would we not tell people, you need to crawl over broken glass to come to him if that's what it was? Because he's worth it. He's worth whatever you would have to endure. Jesus is worth it all. And if we valued Christ, if we truly did, if we believed he was that wonderful and that amazing, if we loved him half as much as sometimes we sing about him, then we would be unashamed and unafraid to call people to drop their baggage and follow after him because we love him so much. That we would say, you, you would love him too. He's that great of a savior. He's that wonderful. We sing songs, isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Jesus, my Lord, he's so wonderful. Do we believe it? Or do we just sing it? I think the evidence is, is shown in how we share the gospel. That we don't have to sell people on Christ. Lift him up. Let him draw all men to himself. Just lift up Christ. Lift up the gate. He is the gate. You enter through Christ. He is the narrow gate. And that's why the call is to drop everything and make Christ everything. The only thing that matters in your life. So I asked this morning, what is Jesus worth to you? Is he worth losing everything to follow after? Is he worth enduring the loneliness? Is he worth enduring the suffering and the sorrow and the heartache and all that difficulty? Is Jesus worth it? And I know that the majority of you in here this morning would say, absolutely, he's worth all of that. You'd probably give a hearty amen. He's worth it. He's worth it. So I'm going to press you a little further. Is Jesus worth getting up 30 minutes earlier to spend 30 minutes in prayer with him every day? Is Jesus worth staying up a little bit later to read your Bible at the end of a long day because you have failed to do so for a while? Is Jesus worth losing sleep for? Is Jesus worth putting aside your phone or laptop or whatever your electronic device or your book and spending more time studying to know him and to know his revelation to you. In fact, I would ask this, is he so valuable to you that you must know him? That you hunger to know him? That you delight to get into his word and study about him? Give me Christ or I die. Is that your testimony? And some might say this borders on legalism. Calling people to such great lengths. No, this is devotion to the lover of your soul. It's devotion, not legalism. We use that as an excuse. If we are seeking his kingdom and his righteousness and seeking that first, what would come before him? Nothing. But I want to encourage you this way. I believe this and maybe challenge you. I believe this with all my heart. With every fiber of my being, I believe this. That when those of us who are in Christ stand before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you are in Christ, you will stand before him one day. We will lament. We will lament. I mean, we'll be, in, we'll be in awe and just, wow. But we'll also have some lament. We'll think, I could have done so much more. 
I could have done so much more. And we'll look at him and say, you, Jesus, were worth so much more than I gave, so much more than it cost me. I didn't obey enough. I wasn't devoted enough. Forgive me for not knowing your worth until this very moment. Forgive us, Lord, for not knowing your worth today, not learning it, and seeking it. And when we view him that way, we will become completely unashamed to call others to come to Christ. Wouldn't we be more bold if that's what we saw in Christ, is that he is everything to us, just a glimpse of his glory. We do it whatever the cost because we truly believe he's worthy. Father, I don't stand up here as a man who has lived out the worthiness of Christ by any stretch of any imagination. I stand under conviction that my life doesn't reflect the value of Christ whatsoever in so many ways. Father, I pray that we would never become content in this life with the things of this life and the things of this world. Help us, O oh Father. Help us to know the value of Christ. Show us. Give us a glimpse of his glory, Father. We want to know him. And we want that to change us, to shape us. Help us. We can't do it without your help. We'll never see it. We'll walk right past it. We ask, we seek, and we knock this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.